up, guys? Welcome back to the DK Podcast. It's your host, Drew Keynes, and you may notice that I'm in a bit of different scenery than my usual uh, bedroom talking head situation. I'm actually at a local pavilion, and I'm doing my first ever in-person podcast. So I got a bunch of gear, uh, super excited to make an awesome product for y'all, and I'm super excited for my guest, too, who is Dr. Kyle Barrett of Clemson University. Dr. Barrett has spent his entire career researching a bunch of different species that are mainly wetland associated. So we're going to spend this episode talking about his career, talking about what a wetland is, which is an incredible system that not a lot of people I think are very familiar with. So yeah, we're going to talk about wetlands. It's going to be awesome. Super excited. Let's get into it. First podcast, I take it? This is my first podcast. Yeah. Awesome. I think they're really fun. Uh, Looking forward to it. Yeah. Kind of like an interview, but more conversational and chill. So pretty fun. I want to do this one because I think wetlands are, I think there's such a disparity between like what people know about them on a public scale versus mm-hmm. just how important they are. Um, I, I think a wet, wetlands aren't really like the most, lux, not luxurious, but like glamorous yeah. ecosystem. I think that's fair. So to speak. Um, yeah. So I really wanted to do this to kind of educate on just how important they are and how intricate they are and how much intricacy there is in the science behind them. I think you're a per- perfect person to do it because of your level of experience with them. Uh, so yeah, what is what is a wetland in like a quick sentence? Sure. So, yeah, uh, a wetland is we th- we think of a wetland as sort of this intermediate between. So everybody knows what an aquatic uh, habitat is, right? Like a lake or a stream. Everybody knows forest. Wetlands kind of in the middle. So you know it's an area that might be inundated for only part of the year, but enough so that you get plants that um, are okay with that. You know, with being inundated, a lot of plants aren't. And uh, you get soils that start to act different because they're saturated all the time, don't have so much oxygen in them. And so yeah. um, those changes in the plants and the soils, that's what uh, scientists and other folks use to delineate wetlands and, uh, and identify them. Yeah, absolutely. So um, did you know, I assume you got into wildlife pretty early. Like I, most people I talk to usually, they, they think they very early Ron realized they love animals, they right. love wildlife, and they know that's what they want to do. When you started out getting into wildlife, well, I mean, when did you? Was it you were you very yeah, so, young? Was so it? no, so it wasn't early. I mean, I think okay. like, like any kid, I'm, you know, it was cool to read books about sharks or, you know, whatever, right? But yeah. uh, no, I thought when I started college, I thought I wanted to be a journalist. Okay. And then I thought I wanted to be a vet. Mm-hmm. And um, while I was, so you got to take an introductory biology course or zoology uh, when I was studying to be a vet and that course blew me away. And yeah. like just the, it was just one of these like diversity of life courses. And so that was when I was locked in on, on, um, being a biologist, but you know, I s- still don't know that I necessarily call myself a, a wetland ecologist. I mean, it is a habitat I'm fascinated by and we do a lot of work in it. Um, but you know, that has just sort of, um, mostly been because of my interest in amphibians. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the most classic wetland associated. Right. right. So, it's, so is that kind of how it manifests? Like as you got interested in biology, you just, you figured out you really wanted to work with amphibians. Yeah. So of- when I, you know, so I was pre-vet, right. And I switched my major to biology and my advisor, um, where was this by the way? This is, so I did my undergraduate at middle Tennessee state university, right. um, which is in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, not too far from where I grew up. And, um, I was a couple years into the major at that point, And I guess my, my advisor had said, um, Hey, we're doing some work as an air force base nearby. And, um, you know, a lot of the Department of Defense properties are huge, right? Because they have these yeah. big buffers. And so there's a lot of opportunity to do natural resource management on there. And so he was doing some research on this base on amphibians. And so he said, um, we've got some drift fences up. They put these fences around the, the wetlands to see which frogs and salamanders are coming in and out. Do you want to describe a drift, a drift fence real quick? Sure. So, so yeah. So if you're if you're studying populations of, of frogs or salamanders at these wetlands, uh, biologists will encircle the wetland in uh, like a silt fence that you might see around a construction site and then they'll dig some holes and drop a bucket down on either side of the fence and so the salamander will bump into the fence turn left or right and then eventually fall in the in the bucket and um, they were doing had running these drift fences for various reasons and so uh, he asked his class it was a vertebrate zoology class you know if anybody's interested in coming out let me know and so this was at the beginning of the semester. So some like mid January morning, I go out to this wetland and there's still ice on the wetland and, but it had rained the night before. And so there were hundreds of spotted salamanders that had fallen into these buckets around the drift fence. And I was just blown away. Like it's like a world I didn't know existed, you know? And so, um, that 
definitely started my fascination with those habitats and with amphibians more generally. Gotcha. So then what did you go on to do in your undergrad? Did you work a lot with spotted salamanders or? So uh, as an undergrad, I worked with him for a little bit. So that just as an aside, the reason he was working on the Air Force Base is he had found some gopher, a couple of gopher frogs on that property, mm -hmm. which is a couple hundred miles away from the nearest known gopher frog population. Oh, wow. And so that's why they had those drift fences there to see if there was actually a breeding population of gopher frogs. So I worked uh, off and on on that base uh, doing surveys for a year and a half or so. We never found another gopher frog, so that's still a bit of a mystery. Mm. Um, but that was some of the undergraduate work that I did. And then uh, the other thing I did was uh, worked um, with a, a wetland ecologist who focused on marine systems. Uh, we were studying on another Department of Defense property, Kings Bay Naval Base down in Georgia, uh, whether uh, marsh salt marsh restoration uh, is equivalent in terms of the ecological function of natural marshes and gotcha. so I was involved in some of that awesome so when you went on to grad school what were you were you still on the amphibian track like what how did you kind of go about that uh yeah so my my master's work I decided well my, my thinking on what I wanted to do bounced around you know so mm -hmm. um I I got very interested in kind of general ecology um particularly sort of uh, island biogeography type stuff and was yeah. I had had read a book song of the dodo I don't yeah. know if you've read it but One of my favorites uh, absolutely sure so that got me really thinking about islands and uh, so I ended up doing this project I went to um, Missouri State for my master's and ended up doing this project where we were studying the productivity of the ocean and how that influences the ecology on these islands and mm -hmm. um, so pretty pretty different you know from the wetland stuff I was doing because these islands are some of the driest in uh, the world. And so, um, but they can be fairly productive because all this marine productivity washes up. So yeah. that's what I was doing for my master's is you know, these sort of cross ecosystem flows of energy and specifically in that case, how it influences the lizards on these islands. Okay. Um, and then went back to my original interest in conservation for my PhD. I went to Auburn University and um, did a project that was focused on how land use change, um, primarily urbanization, alters our streams and, okay. what, and what that means for, for salamanders, but also um, bugs and fish. Gotcha. That's something that I like about ecology is, like you said, you weren't really working with wetlands for your masters, but still those kind of core concepts, especially like I, I'm sure we'll talk about how island biogeography is important for wetlands. Um, I guess so cool are those core concepts. You kind of learn those in any study system and then you can transfer them mm -hmm. to really any interest, which is kind of what I'm doing for my master's work. So yeah, I'm really excited for um, just the way that that manifests. Um, how'd you get to Clemson? Yeah, so uh, when I knew that I wanted to be at a university, I wanted that, um, you know, that for me, the dream job was a job where I could teach and do research. and. Yeah. So, you know, you, when you finish a PhD, especially now, I mean, the jobs are so academic jobs are so competitive that a lot of times you end up doing a postdoc. So I did a postdoc at the University of Georgia and had applied for a handful of jobs uh, that came open. But because of the, the geography, you know, I mean, the, the Appalachians have always been an area of interest. And so, you know, when I saw the Clemson job open, uh, just the, the geography and the fact that it was a job with this, you know, 50, 50 split between research and teaching, I was very excited to uh, apply for it. And so I, um, and it was, it was advertised as a, a wetland slash aquatic ecology I had jobs. I think how it was, was listed, which again, like it's not exactly how I think of myself, but because I do a lot of work with amphibians and, and, um, bog turtles, which is another species we can talk about maybe later. But, um, you know, I think. I had enough of those skill sets that they they hired me and it's been it's been a good fit and it's been flexible because despite that job title um and a lot of our work is in wetlands it's it's not exclusively what we do by any means i mean in fact right now out of the four students that i have only one of them is working on wetland systems and okay. you know the others are more terrestrial focused and so but that's the beauty of of these kinds of jobs is that you know your research can spin off in different directions and and that's okay yeah totally are all your grad students working under um, the concept of ecology, more or less? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, e you know, general ecological principles underline, yeah, most of what we do in my lab. But it, you know, unlike the kind of work I was doing, you know, in Baja California on those islands, 
which was, you know, what I think of as basic ecology, you know, asking these general questions. I mean, I think, you know, almost everything I do now um, has a more applied bent to it, you know, so how, you know, how can we start with that ecological foundation, but then leverage those tools to try and help solve conservation problems and management problems. Yeah. So it's always kind of your end game is like, what can we learn about our ecosystems? And then how can we take that knowledge and effectively manage with it? Yeah, that's an important piece for me. I mean, it, and I don't think it has to be for everyone. Like, I think there's a lot of value in just asking and answering basic ecological questions. But, you know, just in the way that my career has evolved, that's not that doesn't motivate me in the same way, you know, that it, it did when I was starting out. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's, it's necessary. I mean, I know I've heard a lot within like I've worked with hellbenders through Clemson mm -hmm. and I know um, there's a concern that if they get listed as endangered at the federal level that all of the research funding would just like bra conservation studies but if you have all that if you have all that research going to raw conservation and you're not looking at the underlying ecology then how can you effectively conserve right if you don't understand like what those how those animals are living how they're interacting with their environment how can you even take the steps to manage them if you don't know kind of what the effective steps are, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think both are important. I think what happens, you know, a lot of times is when a species becomes exceedingly rare or has, you know, endangered conservation status, just maybe almost by necessity, we have to prioritize where the dollars go. And it's like there, there has to be some kind of often guaranteed management benefit, you know, or, or the perspective for near guaranteed management benefit for for agencies to be willing to you know to spend those dollars because you know something like the endangered species act puts such a burden on agency and landowner time and resources so you know people are trying to bring the species out of that status you know as quickly as possible yeah. um but yeah i mean that you know the those general ecological questions are important because we don't always know um we don't always know when they're going to pay dividends um you know they, they might turn out that that some question that you thought was esoteric initially um, is really valuable in terms of understanding some new disease or physiological issue or whatever the angle might be. Yeah. Yeah. It manifests in a lot of ways and bringing it back to wetlands. Um, I definitely think it's really cool. We can talk about how wetlands are needed to conserve. We need to conserve wetlands for their own sake, but also for just kind of the general ecosystems and up to the biome level around them. So kind of what about wetlands makes them so important for the biodiversity in them and then at the grander scale, just kind of all of biodiversity around the world? Yeah. So in terms of the within wetland dynamics, I mean, these environments and I alluded to this earlier, I mean, they're they're unique relative to the space around them because of the the low oxygen levels in the soil. So it really all starts there because that changes the microbes in the soils, it changes the plants. And so you get, again, sort of relative to the surrounding patches, you get unique uh, flora and fauna in those habitats. Um, you know, so um, that's in terms of the, you know, sort of bottom up productivity, but then because of the hydrological dynamics, the fact that you've got these sites that are in many cases only wet for part of the year, you don't have fish. And so unlike a lake environment where fish are going to kind of drive all the dynamics from, you know, uh, as top predators, you don't have that in wetlands. And so you get all kinds of bugs and salamanders and frogs that you wouldn't get in a river or a lake. Um, so they, they offer these patches of diversity that is different from all the surrounding habitat. Mm. And, you know, so that, that's sort of the, you know, why they're special, uh, you know, if we think about them on a local scale and then if we, you know, scale back, then all of a sudden there's all kinds of ecological processes that come into play. So, you know, wetlands improve our water quality. So the same microbes that are unique to wetlands are in many cases processing nitrogen, you know, runoff from our lawns where we're putting fertilizer or from agricultural fields. Um, you know, those microbes are out processing that nitrogen to a less dangerous form. These wetlands are holding on to water so it doesn't flood our roadways and our houses, um, you know, and, and those are two incredibly important reasons why we need wetlands on the landscape in addition to the, the biodiversity value. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it's definitely very important to emphasize the, the human impacts of um, having wetlands because I think 
you know, we might be preaching to a very niche niche choir right now <laughs> of people who are into this anyways and wanted to conserve biodiversity. But then you have the vast majority who, you know, they're not against conservation, but they'd rather potentially see their, say, their tax dollars go to things that can help them be economically better off for their own sake or their family's sake or you know, help their community in another way. So, yeah, I think this, this human value is very important to emphasize. And I think it's crazy how wetlands have especially in the, con the concept of water and how they just have so many important values to humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, everybody likes clean water. That's an easy thing to rally around. Uh, nobody likes to have floodwaters in their backyard. So I think, you know, it shouldn't. So yeah, wetlands, you know, reputationally, uh, you know, I don't think they're going to be high on anybody's list of places they want to visit oftentimes, which yeah. is a shame because they're pretty cool. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, and I, I say that, you know, for the, you know, speaking about like the general public, I think there's certainly, you know, a lot of birders or, you know, people that are into herps that would love to go to a wetland. But, you know, if you're talking to just the general public and I, I don't think it's hard, it's a hard sell to say, um, you know, these wetlands are filters on the landscape that are um, making it less expensive, right? You're saving tax dollars because that's less uh, treatment processing that you have to do for uh, water cleanup if you've got wetlands on the landscape. I mean, in fact, in some uh, water treatment plants have constructed wetlands as part of the treatment process. Okay. Um, so, you know, we don't, we can do it. Um, we can take advantage of wetlands in the natural landscape, but we can also uh, create wetlands that have, that do some of those jobs. Gotcha. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, it's a shame that some people don't see wetlands as like the, a super cool place to visit. Like uh, if you go, if you go on YouTube, and you, I was, I was taking a trip to Congaree National Park. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll plug Congaree real quick in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And yeah, I was, I was seeing, I'd never been before, so I wanted to see what the deal was. And I went on YouTube, I literally just typed in Congaree National Park. Yeah. The first 10 videos were like, worst national park in America. <laughs> and I was like, no, no. <laughs> and then, then I got there and I, was, I thought this place was incredible. I mean, is, I mean, most of Congaree is a giant wetland. It's yeah. that, kind of that lowland swamp. And since through my coursework, I had kind of an understanding of like a lot of the ecological processes going on. Um, and I was taking your class at the time, so that was kind of also an added benefit. It's just super cool to be in this place and to see all of these different processes going on, see, you know, be able to look at a bald cypress and mm -hmm. see uh, the pneumatophores coming out and see what that what's going on there or see the different wetland associated animals or the different wetland associated even birds. I was, like, you know, birds, you don't think of like a swamp animal, but right. you know, they, had, they had barred owls all over the place. And it was super cool to see how they were kind of interacting with the environment. So I think like a, a general understanding of some ecology can really help people appreciate those places a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there, I, I think there are opportunities like, I mean, Congaree is a good one, although it sounds like maybe the online reputation <laughs> isn't stellar, but um, you know, I, I was on vacation uh, at Folly Beach, you know, last year, year before with family and um, you know, there's a, an Audubon sanctuary, um, it's on the coast, by the way. Yeah. On the coast, South, South Carolina. Carolina. And, uh, mm -hmm. and there's an Audubon sanctuary adjacent to one of the plantation homes that you can go visit, you know, and, um, yeah, they've done a nice job of putting boardwalks through the wetland. And so what would otherwise be inaccessible habitat, you get tourists walking through there and seeing the interior of, you know, these wetlands where they can see, you know, purple gallinule and they can see alligators and all kinds of things up close that they might not otherwise. And so those, yeah, I mean, if you think if people take, you know, some of those easy routes to getting in, you know, to see some of those habitats, they might be surprised by how cool they are. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. So in regard to your research, um, I know you said that right now, you're, some of your grad students are more on terrestrial focused species, but what have you done with specific species that are wetland associated? Like what have those species been? What are kind of their their general ecology um, and kind of what are, what are the methods that you've done to look sure. at them and what questions have you asked? Yeah. So uh, a handful of different things, um, you know, uh, one of the projects that I worked on when I first got to Clemson, um, I had a student um, who uh, helped me do some, some surveys along the coast of South Carolina for black rails um, mm -hmm. and black rails is a, a species of conservation concern throughout its range. So it's this small little bird that um, lives in marshes, salt marshes um, and some freshwater marshes in a couple of patches. But um, we have it on the East Coast and there's population on the West Coast and actually this weird population in the middle of the country as well in marshes. But um, 
they've been declining across their range. And, and the question is, you know, why is that? And, um, and South Carolina was interested in that issue. So each state has these species of greatest conservation need that they direct some priority dollars toward. And so we, we did surveys up and down the coast for, for black rails and tried to understand what habitats they prefer and, and how climate change might influence those species because black rails have such a specific um, hydrological or a, a specific water level that they're targeting. They don't like it if it gets too deep. So they just need a few centimeters of water in the marsh to be happy. So there's some concern about like, what will climate change mean for that species? Yeah. And so did some surveys for black rails and, and interestingly found out that um, that species does really well in South Carolina in our old rice impoundments, which is not something that the state knew before we started doing these surveys. And so um, that's changed the way they survey for the bird. And it's increased our confidence that climate change, at least in South Carolina, the sea level rise might not be as big of a deal for the species because those rice impoundments are somewhat resilient to rise, at least relative to the natural marshes. Um, so we spent a couple of years working on that. Um, we've done uh, some work with a lot of work with bog turtles, which is a, um, a small species of turtle that lives in these bogs and fens um, in the northeastern United States and then along the Appalachian spine in these mountainous or small isolated wetlands where we have bog and fen like habitats as well. And that's a spe another species that's very likely to end up on the um, endangered species list. And so we're trying to understand in North Carolina why do they appear to be declining and what can we do to help bolster populations? And that's, mm. that's been a species I've been working with for oh, almost a decade now. Yeah. Could you share um, in regard to bog turtles, the, the way that you go about tracking their movement that we've talked about before? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, a couple of different ways. I mean, you know, like a lot of turtles, um, if we're just trying to understand broad movement patterns, we'll put transmitters on the shell of the turtle and and you know go back and, and find them but one of the things and i don't know if this is what you're referencing but one of the projects we did recently was um we had a real interest in finding where they were nesting because we thought well we need to understand the fate of those nests is one of the reasons that we're seeing fewer bog turtles because the nests aren't successful yeah and so to do that and the nests are hard to find you don't often just stumble upon them and so uh, we would track these female turtles until they got close to laying the eggs. And you can reach your fingers up in, into the shell and feel the eggs starting to, to harden. And so mm. you know that they're getting close to dropping them. And when they got close, my student, Mike Nora, would um, attach this thread spool to the back of the turtle and then tie one into that uh, thread to, you know, some vegetation and then let it spool out as the female moved around, you know, within about 24 hours of nesting. And so you could go back the next day and follow this crazy, you know, highway of thread and somewhere along that path, find a nest. And then we would put a trail camera on the nest to see what, what happened to it. Nice. Um, yeah. And it, it sounds straightforward. Um, Mike will tell you that it wasn't straightforward and there's a lot of thread tangled up around vegetation. These turtles yeah. cross multiple females with, uh, with spools on them. Oh, crossing yeah, each the other. yeah. Yeah. So it was awesome. I think he's, he's now figured out that it's maybe easier just to go out during the tiny window when they're nesting at night and, and actually just find them laying the eggs. But, yeah. uh, yeah. Did you, um, was that something, a method you found on prior literature or did you just kind of think it up? No, there's a, there's a lot of precedent for it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to know fine scale movements, student that I have now, Megan Novak, she she used for her master's thesis, um, not with me in her prior institution, but she put them on copperheads, you know, because mm -hmm. they were interested in these short term movements, you know, because if you have a transmitter on an animal, you only know where it is when you go out and find it each time. Um, yeah. But if you get the thread spool, you can, you know, for as long as that spool is still unraveling, you can track every little movement they made, which is really interesting and not the kind of data you can really get any other way. So yeah, yeah other folks have, have done that. And gotcha. uh, so we, we borrowed that technique to try to find the, the nests. Nice. I like techniques like that. Cause I think as our technology gets more advanced, you're tempted to use like the most, most cutting edge tools possible, yeah. like the most fancy transmitters or whatever. But that just goes to show you can really effectively do these studies with just a spool of thread and some yeah. glue. Yeah, you can. I mean, you <laughs> know, um, yeah, issues with it just like anything else, but it can be pretty effective, um, yeah. you know, and there are like, you know, there are, we did some barred owl work a couple of years ago and you can get GPS transmitters that will give you that real time movement, you know, mm. like a thread spool will. Um, but the, you know, for something like a tiny turtle, it's hard to get an, an inexpensive transmitter. Sometimes they don't even make them small enough, you know, so that you can get those movements on a turtle and turtle spends a lot of time underground 
transmitter doesn't you know work as well in those environments so. makes sense yeah, yeah i imagine um like you said much cheaper yeah and you know <laughs> that's what sometimes being an ecologist just means uh uh, a MacGyver reference might be um, uh, too too uh, going back too far in time. I don't know if you even know who MacGyver is, but <laughs> another reference. I think everyone knows a reference. <laughs> so uh, you know, that's what we'd always say is like you get a MacGyver solution. You know, just like what can you tape together to come up with you know whatever you need in the field as an ecologist to yeah. you know make the measurement or capture the data, whatever it is. I think that probably marks a lot of good ecologists. Is, um, people have just anyway has been outdoors all their lives and know how to right. work with what they've yeah, got yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the bush. <laughs> Uh, any other species of note that you've worked with that are especially yeah, so, wetland associated? Uh, the other, you know, or another wetland project that comes to mind, I had a student um, recently, David Hutto, um, who was interested in whether green spaces that we have in cities uh, bolster amphibian populations. And mm -hmm. so he worked around the Clemson area um, and, you know, surrounding communities and basically asked, you know, what kind of diversity, if we have a wetland in the middle of Clemson, that's, um, you know, you think of a, a retention pond or, you know, some other kind of wetland that you might have in town, but that doesn't have any designated protection around that. Is that any different in terms of the amphibians versus if we have a, a wetland that's in a park or, yeah. you know, has some sort of green space around it? Um, and so he, I don't know, 60 or some wetlands, several wetlands that he surveyed some of them in forested areas, some of them in urban areas, and then some of them in urban areas with a green space around them. And surprisingly, the green spaces didn't make a huge difference. Um, okay. You know, certainly the reference wetlands in the forested areas were a little bit more diverse and more abundant in terms of the species. But um, we didn't see that they responded well to green space. I think part of that is because we had a real diversity of green spaces. So it included mm. golf courses as well as like parks. Yeah. And so it'd be, I think a next step would be to ask, you know, how much does the type of green space matter and how it gets managed? Gotcha. Makes sense. So, um, you would tease that some of your grad students are doing work with more terrestrial species. What I wanted to talk about a bit was box turtles. Mm -hmm. You're still working on box turtles right now, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, Rogers, yeah. So what is it? What is that project kind of looking like? So this one we're just getting started on, but it relates to a lot of the other work my lab has done. So I mentioned uh, that as a PhD student, I was interested in the effects of urbanization on streams, and then I just talked about David Hutto's work um, and his interest in urban green space. And so you know, one of the themes in my lab is thinking about how when we urbanize the landscape, what does that mean for wildlife? Um, in particular, I'm really interested in the solution side of it. So like what features of the urban landscape allow wildlife to persist? And that's, you know, a question we addressed with with barred owls. And and that's sort of the angle of, of Emma's project on box turtles. So she'll be hopefully tracking box turtles in the experimental forest. So, you know, Clemson has a 17,000 acre experimental forest that um, is around campus. And so we know that that's good habitat in many cases for box turtles. And so she'll be tracking them there to understand how they use the habitat, what's their home range like. And then the goal is to track turtles outside of that environment in town and to understand what allows them to persist in town and how much they're moving back and forth between those habitats. Gotcha. Um, so that's that's, you know, one of the goals. And like I said, her project is, is just getting off the ground. So I'm sure it'll uh, evolve. But um, generally speaking, you know, what's that impact of land use change on the way these box turtles use habitat? Yeah. The other thing I'm excited about with Emma's project is, you know, when we did the barred owl project and then I have a student working on um, king snakes in the Atlanta area right now. Cool. With these urban projects, we've had a lot of success doing outreach on social media to get people to help us find the species to track. Yeah. So if we want to put a transmitter on a box turtle or a barred owl or a king snake, we found that if we advertise it on Nextdoor or some other app, people really respond to that and they get excited. Like when we were putting transmitters on barred owls, literally one time we had like 25 people who neighbors that came or people from, you know, the, the landowner's church and they were there to like watch us put this transmitter on and Mary and my student got to give a little talk about barred owl ecology nice. and the importance of, you know, uh, certain habitat types. So it was a real outreach opportunity. Yeah. So um, we didn't do anything with that except just take advantage of the research opportunity or the, the outreach opportunity, but we didn't uh, ask any questions about it. So this time we've got a, another PhD student in our Parks, Rec and Tourism Management program, and he's going to try to 
actually ask some questions about does involvement as a citizen scientist with these kinds of projects, does that change your perception of local green spaces like, you know, the experimental forest, or does it change your opinion of the importance of wildlife, that kind of thing. So yeah. actually trying to understand the human impact of doing research in urban areas. Awesome. Yeah, iNaturalist especially has been a really cool tool that's kind of yeah. um, come about recently. And yeah, just the way it's so accessible, so so usable, so um, just so fun to use, honestly. If you are anyone from someone who just likes to take pictures in their garden mm -hmm. to a full-on researcher who right. takes advantage of it to be able to reach out to the community and gain real scientific data from what people are finding. Yeah, I mean, it. you know, there are a number of tools out there online that have really revolutionize the kinds of questions we can ask. I mean, an I naturalist is, is one of them. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of folks, um, you know, just, yeah, regardless of the, their scientific training, you get excited about seeing, you know, a species or you get excited in the spring when the, uh, red buds first open or whatever it is and making those kinds of observations and logging them. Um, you know, if enough people do that over long enough periods of time, you can ask all kinds of questions that otherwise you, you wouldn't have been able to ask. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really, and as you've seen with your, you have, um, what is it, like a QR code now where you can go on, they can sign on to an iNaturalist project and help your grad student find box turtles. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, yeah. um, you know, can report sightings, uh, take a picture of the, the back of the shell. And, you know, the hope is that those shell markings will be distinct enough that we'll be able to see when animals have been, you know, recaptured in, in air quotes, but, you know, just recited, um, you know, mm. from these images. And, and one of the ideas we've played with is, um, you know, could we even uh put a qr code on like the turtle shell and have wow, okay. have folks you know take pictures of that so that we could distinctly you know track these individual movements for the turtles mm -hmm. that we don't have transmitters on gotcha um and then you know you you could imagine if you do that you know you scan that code it takes you to a site where you get information about that specific turtle where else has it been how old is it you know is it a male or a female and so another learning opportunity you know yeah. for the citizens that would participate in that yeah that, that's really cool that's so I like how interactive that is. And it's really low tech. I mean, right. All you got to do is, like you said, print out a little, whether it's actually a QR code or some other type of identifier, put it on this animal. And then it's crazy that a person could find this turtle crossing a trail or something. Sure. Take a picture of it. And then all of a sudden find a bunch of information on it. Yeah. On yeah. the individual on a website. Right. Right. Absolutely. So a, a super that's, cool thing. you know, an idea that that, uh, yeah, Emma had had come up with. And so we're going to try to pursue it. You know, I awesome. think we'll see what comes of it. I'd love to see what happens. Yeah. With that. Yeah. I um. The people I do, I'm doing working with now for the podcast, we designed an iNaturalist page for their fan base, and they have thousands of fans all around the world. And basically, the it's a project just like the Box Turtle Project. And the idea is just to see this. This is a wildlife podcast, so it is to see where fans from around the world are seeing animals and what they're seeing. And then we're actually doing a YouTube segment where we, me and a co-host, pick a couple of our favorites every week, and we just kind of pick three species and we talk about them, give some cool facts highlight the person that found them. Oh, yeah, it's been it. super cool because like all it is, we just made the project and, you know, it's like build it and they will come. Yeah. And then just people who are obviously wildlife lovers because they follow the podcast, just join the project. We're up to like 250 now. And you can do like a world map on iNaturalist and literally every continent is just peppered with little red dots of just all different animal biodiversity. Right. And just the diversity of things people are finding and sharing is I couldn't even imagine. No, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, it's really cool. So that's been a fun thing to pursue. Yeah, I think those are the great ways to, you know, take take this technology and just sort of use it to to engage, you know, people where they are. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, it doesn't take a lot of effort for for them to, you know, take a photo, upload it and then be part of a bigger community. Absolutely. Yeah. And so on that note, um, we're bringing us some closing thoughts back to wetlands. How would you say people like, on the citizen science level or even at a higher level than that, how could people go about helping to conserve wetlands in their everyday life just through whatever they're doing in their everyday sure. activities? Yeah. I mean, I think there are a handful of things. Um, you know, one of them is just take care of your local watershed. I mean, I think that, you know, thinking about how you dispose of waste is big. Um, you know, the, um, microplastics issue is a really important one for all of us to think about. And so, um, you know, that waste ends up downstream or downhill in a wetland. And so, 
um, you know, being responsible about just, you know, how you dispose of trash and doing things like, you know, avoiding, you know, drain, you know, I don't know how many people change their oil on their own anymore, but if, you know, if you're changing your oil on your own, make sure you dispose of that properly rather than let it go down a drain or, you know, into the backyard. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's a, an easy one. Um, you know, you know, just take care of your waste. Um, the other thing that we talked about earlier that I think is important is taking the time to go visit, you know, some of these sites, uh, some of these wetlands so that you can share, you know, with others. I think I'm a firm believer. It's part of the reason I'm a teacher that uh, the more people understand about a system, the more likely they are to, or about a thing in general, the more likely they are to protect it. Mm. Um, and I, I also, you know, think that there is uh, something to be said for uh, just being civically and politically engaged, you know. So if you think um, wetlands or any natural habitat is important, that's something that you should let your you know, state and federal representatives know, um, yeah. you know, and if 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 they know that's a priority, um, then if they know that their um, um, constituents think that's a priority, then they're likely to make it a priority. Um, mm. You know, and there, there are bipartisan ways to make that happen. Like there's a um, something called a blue ribbon panel. It's a, a bipartisan group that is pushing some new state funding for wildlife that would, you know, benefit wetland species and many other species um, that looks like it might pass. And if, if that gets enough support, that could revolutionize conservation dollars um, across, you know, the country for years to come. So, yeah. um, you know, I think being civically and politically engaged is, is something else that people can do. Yeah, I definitely think um, that's probably one that people don't think too as quickly. They don't, they don't think of the, the power of legislation they might think of more like small scale things you said, like like keep your house, you know, um, don't cause a lot of runoff of pollutants yeah. or things like that. But yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of lot to be said in making your legislators aware of these issues because they might not even be, like I said, like this podcast, this episode is designed to kind of express what a wetland is. Like legislators might not even know what a wetland mm-hmm. is and why they should care about it. Right, right. But, you know, I think it um yeah because of flood control and water quality it matters but also you know just um even if the wetland itself is not important it's part of these bigger ecosystems right so you may not be into wetlands but maybe you like to turkey hunt or deer hunt or rabbit hunt and you know those systems even though those animals aren't living there full time they're stopping by to get a drink right so it's just part of the larger forested ecosystem that i think a lot of people a lot of listeners you know would care about absolutely yeah and um on the more scientific side you get a lot of young listeners, a lot of people who are in high school or college, people that are have not advanced as far as I have in, in wildlife biology and certainly not as far as you have. Um, I always like to take the opportunity to let my guests kind of use all their experience to say, like, just what general advice they would give for pursuing a career in this field, whether it be someone who is super gung ho about wetlands or just mm-hmm. anything within wildlife biology or even anything in, in science. Yeah. Yeah, what would be kind of some yeah, I general think, advice? You know, so depending on, it, I guess the advice depends on where you are um, in, you know, what stage you're at. But if, if you're a high school student and you're thinking, well, maybe, you know, wildlife biology might be for me, then I think, you know, the advice is you spend as much time outside as you can and, you know, learn about those systems, engage with those systems, whether that's like, because you hunt or because you're out in a wetland at night, you know, trying to see how many frog species you can find or you're cataloging plants or whatever, right? Like just that being in those environments, um, having that firsthand knowledge is, is going to benefit you when you go through formal coursework. Um, you know, um, and then, you know, there are, you know, like DNR runs a, a wildlife camp, you know, so you could do the kind of thing, you know, in high school and get some early experience. And then once you get into college, I mean, this, you know, what I tell all of my students is um, classroom stuff's important, but it is far more important what you do out of the classroom. And I mean, I think you've had a ton of those experiences, you know, throughout your undergraduate uh, years. And, um, you know, so hopefully you'd agree that like the the those firsthand experiences you're getting exposed to to what faculty the other 50 percent of what faculty do you know the research yeah. side and what it means to be a graduate student and you start to see how you can contribute i mean you know the cool thing about what we do is um we're we're working on problems where nobody knows the answer that's why we're working on them and so it's it's cool to be engaged in something where you're trying to you know solve a problem where the answer's not not clear 
And, um, you know, I think getting involved as an undergraduate early on in that and all you got to do, and this is how I got involved, is you just got to go knock on a professor's door and say, um, hey, do you need any help with your research? Mm. And in fact, even a high school student can do that. I mean, there I, I had a student a couple of years ago who said, I think I want to be a biologist um, as a high school student as a high school student. And she said, I'm really interested in stream salamanders. And so I helped her. Uh, carve out a, a little project and she she lived near Atlanta and so she actually worked in the Chattahoochee um, National Park and in some of the streams and sampled some salamanders and um, ended up getting into Pitt and then she has a she just graduated I think last semester with a degree in biology and is nice. looking to go on to grad school so mm-hmm. you know I think you can yeah I mean you know, if you're a high school student with a real interest in research, pop by your local university and introduce yourself or send an email, introduce yourself to faculty and see if they've got ways you can get involved. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's um, usually what I tell people too is get involved and get involved early, especially because a lot of time you, you really don't even know. A phrase I like to say that I've said on the podcast a lot is you don't know what you don't know, Mm -hmm. which I think is so applicable in in life, but especially in research, it's like you don't know what systems are out there you don't know what species are out there you don't know just so many of these different aspects of what your career could be and you can't be passionate about something if you don't know what it is so just kind of making that effort to connect to someone and then them exposing all their experience to you you can discover these things that you might not have even thought Mm -hmm. you know maybe like you said you didn't know that wetlands would be a major part of your career yeah and you may not have even known early on what what went into wetland ecology but you're, through your interest in amphibians, that all manifested, and now it's a significant part of your career. So I just think that, yeah, just people going out and putting themselves out there, they can find opportunities that they didn't even know existed that they might not have even mm-hmm. specifically been looking for. Yeah, and the phrase like putting yourself out there is an important one to linger on for a bit because it can feel vulnerable, I think, because particularly yeah. early on, you don't, uh, because you don't know what you don't know, you feel like maybe you should know more, you don't know enough, and are they going to think... Uh, that I'm sm- not, not smart enough to do this or whatever. And, and I mean, those, uh, you, you can't make those vulnerabilities go away. Um, you just have to sort of persist in the face of them. And I, I, you got to be willing to do that and, and realize in most cases, people want to help you succeed. Um, you know, jump into the deep end and, you know, you, you'll make mistakes. Um, you'll, you'll feel like you don't know enough, but the whole way, like you're, you're learning and you're getting better and you're getting prepared for that next step, you know? So I think you just, you just have to do it. You just have to, as my father would say, just do something, even if it's wrong and yeah. <laughs> figure it out, course, correct, move on. Mm. Yeah. It's, um, kind of the manifest, man, I feel like imposter syndrome kind of manifests for all people really like whatever, with, despite the level of, um, experience you have in the field. And it's easy to feel like like you said, that you don't know enough, you're not smart enough, you don't have enough experience, you don't deserve to be in a certain position. But everyone was in that position at some point. Everyone everyone didn't have the experience until they did. So yeah, I definitely think it's important to just kind of try, like you said, it's not impossible to just cut it off, but definitely important to limit those thoughts best you can and just be confident that your, um, your what's the word? Not your go-getterness, but your, um, <laughs> your excitement over these topics and your willingness to work hard will get you there Mm -hmm. as you make the connections and start to get the experience. I think that's right. You know, I mean, so you sort of couple that, you know, um, persistence and enthusiasm with a little bit of humility and sort of be willing to learn and embrace new ideas. And, you know, I mean, like I, I say this to grad students, I mean, I think it's true for a lot of things like, you know, the it's important to to study, make good grades, you know, but, but intellect is, is certainly not, um, the majority of what it takes to succeed. I mean, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's important to do well in school, but, the uh, and have that foundational knowledge, but, um, man, persistence is, is so important. Totally. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. Like, I think it's easy growing up, at least in the American education system. It's like, there's the kids that everyone was like, they're like, they're the super smart kids or they're, these are the young geniuses. Mm-hmm. But I think once you get through grade school and you come to college and you're pursuing a career, especially in science, it's obviously having a bit of smarts is good and being studious is good, but it really comes down to the persistence, the work ethic, the way you interact with people, like just how, yeah. how you treat people, just all of those things coming together and make you a more complete person. That's what will make you successful mm-hmm. ultimately. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. Yeah. Yeah. Any closing thoughts? 
just appreciate the opportunity. This is, uh, yeah, it's it's fun to, to do a podcast. Yeah, I, I think they're great. I mean, kind of like an interview, like I said, but more chill. Get to talk about stuff you love. Listen to them all the time. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to checking out your back catalog now. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. All right, man. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrett, for joining. Guys, I thought this was such a cool episode. I think wetlands are so fascinating, and Dr. Barrett's expertise has been just really cool to me. I had him for a class, actually, and it was probably one of my favorite courses during my undergraduate career. So I really want to just kind of share that with y'all, kind of just a taste of what he does and what he knows, because I think wetlands are so important. I think they're so interesting, and I'm hoping that you guys agree. So yeah, thank you for tuning in to another great episode of DK Podcast. See you next episode. Mm -hmm.